My name is Tamar McKee. I am the manager of the Stephen H. Hart Research Center, as well as the coordinator of the Insights and In-Person Connections programs. I wanted to begin this program today with a land acknowledgement. In the spirit of healing, we acknowledge and honor the Ute, Cheyenne, and Arapaho tribes and all the original indigenous nations of the land upon which History Colorado Center and our other museums and historic properties stand. Again, my name is Tamar McKee. I'm the manager of the Stephen H. Hart Research Center. We usually play venue to the Insights and In-Person programs, but today we're coming to you live from our computers. Um, but when you do have the opportunity uh, to access the Stephen H. Hart Research Center, we are available both now remotely in digital as well um, as in person. And through all of those means, we are the public access portal for researching History Colorado's collection. We dynamically assist researchers from all backgrounds with exploring our photography, archives, and artifacts to use for a multitude of projects. That can be genealogical research, historic property designation, work for school assignments, um, design inspiration, and writing books, as is the case for Virginia Sanchez's latest book, Pleas and Petitions, the Hispano Culture and Legislative Conflict in Territorial Colorado that just came out from CU Press um, last month in March. So Virginia, I'd love to talk to you a little bit more about how um, the Heart uh, Research Center might have helped you with this book and um, um, Great. arguments you put forth today, certainly. Okay, I want to pull up the screen real fast. Um, and actually, Virginia, we'll, we'll have a, we'll have time to do that. I just want to um, quickly introduce the Insights and In-Person um, and the Borderland Lecture Series, and then we're okay. going to go through um, introducing all of our presenters, and then I'd love, we'd love to hear more about your book. Okay. Too. Well, I had heard the story about the Espinosas a um, long, long time ago, and I always wondered whether it was true or not. Yeah. Can you hear me okay? We can, yes. And um, so uh, as I was doing some research in Southern Colorado, I, I did read the books, the Tom Tobin uh, book, The uh, um, Season of Terror, and also Tom, Tom Tobin Frontiersman. I think that's the last one. And so in those books, you know, they talked about the genealogy and they talked about um, stories that they had heard and whatnot, but there wasn't anything really substantial there. So I kept wondering, okay, I, I want more. And so I uh, looked into the um, archives over at Colorado History Center, the Hart Library, and I was really astounded to find in the um, Colorado Magazine, lots of historical articles that were available talking about the 1860s and um, the Espano settlements there and also uh, the Espinosas. Um, also at the Hart Library, there was the Tom Tobin manuscript of, on the Espinosas. And um, what was the other one I wanted to mention? Oh, the CWA Pioneer interviews. Those were extremely helpful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I and also then I also went to the National Archives and found some information there. And also because I was looking at uh, the territorial laws, I uh, looked at uh, the Weiss Library um, of the University of Colorado. Awesome. And I think that's really important for people here today to realize where, and we'll get a big taste of that with James um, actually having the artifacts with him today in the museum, about um, all that we're talking about has this incredibly rich historical and material cultural record to it today. So that's something that's such a, a wonderful opportunity we have here today. Um, and that's what the Insights and In-Person program is all about. It's a program series developed by Curatorial Services and Collections Access staff at History Colorado to offer history lovers, those folks of you who have joined us today, to hear in person, however digitally mediated, from people making history matter. And we do so through insightful connections back to History Colorado's collection and mission. For the purpose of the program today, the intention was to bring you insights via the YouTube video. Um, and if you haven't had a chance to watch that ahead of time, we've dropped the URL, the link to the YouTube video in the chat box, and the presenters will go through for five minutes what their, um, their lecture is. So that's kind of the insights part 
And then the in-person part is to have this Zoom platform where people joining us, it seems like from all over the country to be able to engage in really um, extensive dialogue, share your own impressions, perhaps growing up with the Espinosa tale really is about having the in-person conversation and connection. So we're trying to approximate that here in this program today. I also want to um, mention um, that this program, it's our first collaboration that we've done, the Insights and In-Person with the Borderlands of Southern Colorado Lecture Series. And that's based out of History Colorado's Community Museums of El Pueblo, Fort Garland, which figures so prominently in the Espinosa story, and Trinidad. Stemming from the Borderlines Exhibit Initiative, this lecture series features art, authors, artists, scholars, and activists from around the country to deepen our discussions and complicate the narratives on various Southern Colorado borderlands topics. This series is sponsored by Colorado State University Pueblo, and um, talks are normally held at the Fort Garland Museum and Cultural Center, and those are sponsored further by the Sangre de Cristo National Heritage Area. And we're going to be dropping links to the Insights and In-Person and Borderline, Borderlands lecture series in the chat box for you folks today. Great. And um, so before we move on to officially introducing today's presenters, um, I'm going to explain to you how we imagine the program working today. And this is the first time for all of us here. So we really appreciate your patience and going along with us today. But we have two features one of you, which you've already been using, which is the chat box. That's where we can support you with technology as well as other resources and links. When you do have questions for the presenters, and we will open that up here in just a few minutes, we do have a Q&A um, uh, uh, icon at the bottom of your toolbar screen. That's where we encourage you to put pose your questions to the presenters here today. You can address them uh, directly by saying, Virginia, can you talk a little bit more about how archive, archival research played a role? Um, or you can pose questions to all of the presenters. Uh, I will take myself off of video here in just a little bit and I'll just be behind the scenes moderating Q&A where my wonderful colleague Bethany Williams is helping me on the chat box today. I see we've already got people using both the chat box and the Q&A. Um, we're just going to give it a shot today. Just really want to give you many platforms to um, ask your questions. And um, checking in with all of our boxes here doesn't look like if anybody has any questions or have any technological needs, we're here for you. Looks like we're good for now. With that being said, I will begin by introducing James Peterson. He will then go ahead and introduce Virginia and Matt. Then the three presenters will give their five minute recaps of their lectures. And then we're gonna you know, set, the, set you loose on asking questions of our presenters. And I have a feeling the presenters have a few questions for themselves as well. Okay. Yeah, so James, I'll go ahead and, and read your bio real fast and then I'll jump off the screen. Okay, all right. Cool. All right. So, <clears throat> Assistant Curator for Artifacts at History Colorado since 2016, James S. Peterson has worked in the museum collection since 2001 when he was recruited as a volunteer. Since that time, he has researched, questioned, written, and made presentations about the provenance, authenticity, and relevance of numerous Colorado historical artifacts. His interest in those attributed to the Espinosas lies as much with the motivations of the people who collected them as with the legendary Espinosas themselves. And James, I'll hand it over to you. Okay, thank you, Tamar. <clears throat> so uh, as Tamar said, my name's James Peterson. Uh, I'm assistant curator for artifacts here at the museum. Uh, one of my responsibilities here is to uh, research and to document uh, uh, artifacts collection. And a lot of those uh, artifacts uh, that we look at are new donations or they're artifacts that uh, for some reason uh, were insufficiently cataloged, uh, although uh, data might be available in our records. Um, <clears throat> when, when I'm looking at some of our older records uh, and artifacts, um, some, of the, some of the reasons we're doing that is uh, we get patron requests through our uh, research center. And uh, 
either through that through that or we also uh, I get a lot of requests I work with exhibit teams as well so uh, through through those two avenues um, that gives me the chance to look at a lot of artifacts that we haven't uh, uh, that we haven't looked at in a long time and that maybe we need to dust off so um, so this presentation today is really the consequence of one of those uh, inquiries um, this past August I received a telephone call from uh, from a writer named uh, Robert Sanchez uh, who was uh, researching for an article that he was going to do on the Espinosa brothers. Um, in fact, uh, this is the product of that 5280 magazine, which was published in uh, December of 2019. And and this is the story. And this before lands, that, I had written a letter that never got to you. So um, anyway, so Robert had uh, a couple of questions. Uh, one, which is probably the most important, was uh, he wanted to know if we knew uh, uh, who gave the revolvers that we have on display in our Zoom and exhibit uh, who actually took those off of uh, the bodies of uh, the Espinosas? Uh, the other question he had, well, it wasn't a question so much as a statement. He had been uh, in touch with a researcher. Uh, this might have been you, Virginia, I'm not sure. He, yes. be he believed uh, uh, that the revolvers that we had were a different model than uh, what we stated. He, he thought they were model 1863, uh, and in fact, um, uh, they they were there are two different models. One of them is model uh, 1858 uh, New Remington Navy revolver, and one is the model 1860. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, sorry, a Colts Army model 1860. So the models we had were correct, uh, but the model number doesn't necessarily uh, say what, when it was manufactured. <clears throat> so um, bet between those two uh, uh, inquiries from, from Robert, uh, I invited him into the museum to, uh, to uh, look at the, the revolvers and to talk about them, as well as uh, I told him that we have a number of other uh, artifacts in the collection that are attributed to the Espinosas, and uh, I'd be glad to pull those and, um, and look at them. So when he came in, we, uh, we started talking about the possibilities of, uh, uh, of them, well, ha whether they were authentic or not, uh, uh, especially because uh, the revolvers, for example, are um, pretty, you know, the time period is about the same time as uh, what was going on with the Espinosas down in the San Luis Valley. The Model 1860 revolver was um, manufactured in 1862, uh, which, which uh, puts it pretty close to when they started their, their spree. And the Model uh, 18, the new Model 1858, the Remington, uh, we don't know exactly when when it was manufactured because the records at Remington only go back to 1921. We do know, however, that the uh, that the revolver was was only made for a short period of time, uh, beginning in 1863, and uh, uh, ending in 1875. And there were only 28,000 of them manufactured, so that also is right on the border. So um, anyway, um, when we started talking about that, we started questioning, uh, you know, what the source of all of the artifacts that we have in the Espinosa collection uh, were. And uh, to be quite frank, um, you know, that's a, that's a big task. Um, this uh, museum has uh, close to 15 million artifacts in the collection. And um, that, that includes photographs and manuscript material, uh, as well as uh, three-dimensional objects and art and that kind of stuff. Uh, so, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, a big, it's a big 
chore to to uh, uh, to manage all of that, and uh, and the curators, uh, you know, we we're kind of generalists. Uh, we can't be experts in everything. Um, you know, I I know a little bit, or I I know a little bit about a lot of things, but I. Uh, uh, I don't know much about any one particular thing. So uh, we depend upon uh, volunteers quite a bit. And, uh, and there are a lot of people out there that uh, have interests uh, about particular things and have specialties. And um, uh, through that, we recruit people who can help us uh, with this research. And uh, <clears throat> when it came to this collection, I definitely uh, needed some help to uh, to start digging into our records to see uh, if we could find out some information about uh, who the donors were and uh, how the donors themselves might have uh, obtained uh, the things that we've got attributed to the Espinosas. So um, at, that, at that time, this was late August, um, I knew that we had um, a volunteer who had been working on a, a, a project uh, with our collections department. Uh, he had been uh, rehousing our handgun collection. And uh, I'm gonna give you, a, I'm gonna show you an example of, uh, of his work. This is, uh, this is, if I can get it there. These are, the, these are the mounts, the storage mounts that they made. Uh, they're custom made for each individual artifact, each individual handgun. And, um, and anyway, that project had just come to an end. And uh, Matt Lopez uh, was the person who uh, was working on those. And I knew that he had a, a strong interest in genealogy and some of his ancestry uh, went back to uh, San Luis Valley and beyond. So uh, I asked him if he would uh, like to, uh, to uh, help me do some researching and that's where uh, Matt came in to uh, the picture. And uh, I'm just gonna read you a little bit about Matt's, about Matt's um, history here. So Matthew Lopez is a multi-generational Colorado native of Denver. Uh, he has traced his ancestry to Hainisaros. Um, I'm going to let you pronounce that a little bit better, Matt, when the time comes here. Um, and I'm going to let you describe what that is as well. Uh, he's, uh, he's got ancestry as well uh, from explorers and early settlers in the San Luis Valley. And um, yeah, and as I've already s stated, you know, he... Uh, He's, he's worked in the collection with us, uh, with, with the gun collection. So um, since, the since the time he began researching for uh, uh, these artifacts, uh, we came to uh, enjoy working with him so much and his expertise uh, and passion for the, for the uh, uh, research that uh, we've put him on as a contractor uh, and he's been uh, um, surveying and uh, refining our uh, Fort Gar uh, well artifacts that came from Fort Garland uh, recently when we uh, when we redid some of the exhibits there. So um, before Matt, before I turn it over to you, uh, I just want to say that <clears throat> after after we got or after I'd met with uh, Robert Sanchez. Uh, and we had looked at those artifacts, it turned out that um, Virginia Sanchez, no relation to Robert, uh, Virginia uh, was doing a presentation down uh, at the El Pueblo History Museum in uh, uh, Pueblo. And uh, her talk was on the Espinosa brothers. So of course I had to make a trip down there to, uh, to see what she, had, what she had to say. And of course, uh, uh, what, what her focus really was, what was really good about uh, her research was she uh, gave a lot of context to um, what was happening uh, in the San Luis Valley at the time uh, that, that 
contributed to uh, the events uh, surrounding the Espinosa brothers. So, um, so, after, so I contacted Virginia and we did the same thing. We did a behind the scene tour and uh, we looked at a lot of the artifacts, all of them that we had attributed to, to Espinosa's as well as some that we thought maybe could be, but maybe not. And uh, uh, to be quite honest, the impression that, that I got during that meeting is that, um, that Virginia probably does not believe most of these are authentic artifacts. Are, they're authentic artifacts, but uh, not, attributed, not attributable to uh, the Espinosas. And she'll tell you more about why she thinks that uh, when she does her presentation. So let me uh, just uh, uh, introduce Virginia. Uh, Virginia is an independent researcher and successful author. Uh, she, lives in, she lives here in Colorado. Her book, Forgotten Cucharinos of the Lower Valley, won the 2011 Miles History Award, and her co-authored article, Displaced in Place Nuevo Mexicanos on the northern side of the New Mexico-Colorado border, won the 2018 Gilberto Espinoza Prize for best article published in the New Mexico Historical Review. Her most recent publication, just released this past spring, is the book, Pleas and Peti Petitions, Hispano Culture and Legislative Conflict in Territorial Colorado. So everybody, please give a warm welcome to Virginia Sanchez. Virginia? Thank you, here I am. I'm gonna move here quickly to this screen and Okay, so what we know about the Espinosas is that they were accused of several murders in um, and around Southern Colorado. And uh, uh, some of those men have been named and four of them were in a certain area that I want to show you a little bit later. Um, and so we have that uh, these murders were appearing and um, so I kept asking myself, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. We got to know what happened during the time, what was happening during 1861, 1862, and 1863, but the story still went further back. So in 1860, 1859, and 1860, we have a lot of things happening. We've got miners that are coming into um, the area that's not, it's Indian territory before it became basically what you see here is uh, Colorado Territory. And then we have Hispanos who are coming north from New Mexico Territory uh, who actually received Ute permission uh, to enter the area and to settle the area. Then we also have the legislature, well, excuse me, um, we're talking about the Congressional uh, Congress that's saying, all right, well, we want a territory in the West that looks like a state looks like a square, excuse me, that looks like a square in the middle of a map of the United States. So they decided to put four uh, land pieces from four territories that you see here, one of them being New Mexico Territory. Well, when they did that in 1861, it changed the lives of 7,000 people, Nuevo Mexicanos, Spanish speakers, Catholics, and uh, very deep in custom and tradition. And it brought them in with the many other Anglo Protestants who were now in the territory of Colorado. But the picture, you've seen this in the um, presentation, but it, it's really bigger than this part. Okay, uh, sorry about that. There were still so many other issues taking place. There was a civil war there was um, uh, patrols that were coming into Fort Garland from different places, including F Fort Union. Um, there were Ute incursions, I'll, I'll call them incursions, but uh, 
uh, Ute incursions with the settlers, but the settlers were really complaining about the Utes. The Utes um, and their complaints then turned the soldiers onto the Utes uh, and created a bigger problem for all of the settlers. Then the miners here, I don't know whether you can see this, this area. All right, so the miners are coming in and they're illegally trans, uh, uh, transporting uh, or squatting sometimes on uh, land grant land. So we've got some, a lot of conflicts there. This is creating some problems and the legislature then gets started. So we have our two Hispanic legislators who are uh, representing Conejos and Costilla County who attend the first legislature and there's not an interpreter for them. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more because one of uh, the, uh, it goes back to the, um, uh, the executive branches. And I'm going to see if I can go back to this, whoops, this map right here. All right. This was made this change to put New Mexico territory in that area was made without a vote of the people from New Mexico. So um, if they had a vote, they would have said, no, we want to stay in New Mexico where we have a bilingual legislature. Um, we're with other people who are in similar religion and language and custom. And, um, but that didn't happen. So one morning they woke up and they discovered that they were in a new territory under Anglo rule and uh, English language. Um, all right, the Civil War is coming in, so that's a real big thing too. And I mentioned the incursions with the Utes. Now, um, in 1863, there's a Ute conference that brought 500 uh, soldiers into the area. So there's a lot more conflict that's happening there. Um, let's see, what else I can tell you about? Oh, I wanted to go back to the map. Okay, so the Espinosas are somehow accused of doing all of these murders. And we see that there's conejos down here at this area. And, um, and then we've got some murders happening up here in the northern part uh, by Leadville, Fair Play, um, Dead Man's Canyon, just west of Colorado City, Hard Scrabble, and then one by the uh, uh, Werfano Butte. Now it's a long way from conejos to all of these areas. But anyway, the trip was made. Now, when, once the uh, Espinosas were accused, um, we've got two different sets of, uh, of two groups of people that are out looking for them. So we've got the, the uh, John McCannon California boys who are actually near this Leadville area, okay? And uh, then we have Tom Tobin who l later finds the Espinosas or some of the Espinosas at Libby Pass. And um, now, um, John McCannon and his California Gulch miners are a mob, or a vigilante mob, then, that go on the hunt for the Espinosas. They find um, a camp um, right about in this area, and I think it's called Oil Spring. And so John McCannon asks his best sharpshooter to shoot into the camp. He ends up shooting Vivian, one of the brothers, to Felipe, a brother to Felipe, and um, the shot, I think, injures him, but then a second shot actually blows Vivian's face off. Now, there's um, the three of the Espinosas um, that, well, for sure, two at this location, which are Vivian and his brother Felipe, Felipe being the older brother. Now, I, <clears throat> I, I mentioned in my book that at that time, the, this uh, vigilante mob could have actually uh, approached the Espinosa brothers and um, um, arrested them. But in, in, in this case, they didn't, they just shot into the camp. But anyway, um, Vivian is dead because of the shot to his face and uh, Felipe escapes. So um, let's see, these other, uh, there were four murders that were occurring in this area between March and April. And then it's in May when the California Gulch boys find the camp and shoot um, Vivian. It's not until October when Tom Tobin finds 
um, Felipe and a nephew by the name of Vicente here near La Vida Pass. But what's interesting too is when we take a look at what was happening within the Conejos area, specifically where the Espinosas lived. Now the Espinosas lived in the San Judas, Judas de Tadeo Plaza that was within the San Rafael district. Now, Felipe is shown here as being 38 and Vivian at, at 30. Now, this census comes from a military census um, conducted by Major Archibald Gillespie in 1863. He was at San Judas de Tadeo, but he started his census in 1862 in other uh, areas of Conejos. And from this census, we do find that, uh, well, let me go back to the purpose of the census. The New Mexico Military District was interested in uh, finding how much arms and ammunition and food stores that were, might be available in the Conejos area should the Confederate forces move north into Colorado during the Civil War period. So um, Colonel or Major Archibald Gillespie comes into the San Judas de Tadeo Plaza. Now he rides in with a bunch of troopers that are on horseback and in a wagon. So um, actually the, the women um, that saw them coming right away ran to the area and they, they said, uh, the soldiers are coming, the soldiers are coming. Now the Espanos at this time were very afraid of having to be conscripted into service into the uh, uh, Union Civil War. The year prior to the Civil War in 1860, they had already been um, uh, in a militia group called the Conejos Militia that was uh, looking out for uh, incursions by the Navajo. And uh, these militias went out periodically. So they were used to doing military duty, but not under uh, an American rule, um, or I should say an all English rule. Um, what else? Uh, okay, so then we find that there are a few arms here. All right, so the whole district of Conejos had 226 rifles. Now look at the number of muskets, 29 muskets. They're, they're working with antiquated uh, arms. And um, then we find that we, for the total area, they have 135 pounds of powder. So I took a look at this and I said, well, that's not anything to, um, uh, there, at one time there was an insurrection and the people got together and they had held a, a secret meeting. Well, a merchant by the name of Postoff right away sent off two letters to Major Meyer at Fort Garland and he said, we're in trouble. We, we need to uh, see what these Mexicans are doing. They're having a secret meeting. So, um, Major Meyer then gets his troops from Fort Garland. They travel to uh, Conejos. They find this meeting and they, they bust into the meeting. They arrest, uh, they made an arrest of two people that I think had muskets and, um, and then a total of three men were taken in. Nothing happened. There was, uh, uh, um, Although they were arrested, they were able to escape, but there was never a warrant issued for them. So, you know, you have to take a look at the military records, and there are none that actually state that they were arrested. So, um, what actually was happening during those secret meetings was that the people were getting together and trying to, to determine whether they could petition to get back into New Mexico territory. Um, but again, if we take a look at uh, the Espinosas and what they had, Vivian didn't even own an arm and they had no ammunition. Now, uh, Felipe owned a carbine and only a half pound of ammunition. Now, how true this census is, we're just having to go by what um, Major Gillespie provides, but he does say that um, the people who were providing them the information he, he doesn't trust. But he's skeptical anyway, because he's already saying that um, um, they're unpatriotic, they're bad citizens, and uh, he says that he knows that these people are, are not good people, but he doesn't exactly state why. So they, we know that there is some prejudice there. Now, Archibald had learned Spanish 
while serving in California during the Mexican-American War. And um, the Mexican-American War is a, still is an important part with all of this and in Southern Colorado because of the fact that the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo had, um, had uh, enabled the people to uh, uh, be on their land grants and to maintain their language, right? Now we have a lot of miners and new settlers that are coming in that are squatting on the land. Then the United States says, well, in order to determine uh, who's got the land and, and how much, uh, they want the land grants to be confirmed. So um, the people in Conejos are submitting petitions to get their land grant confirmed, and it does not happen during this territorial period. So we've got more um, um, squatters coming in, and the people are are starting to get really upset. Now, on the legislative side, okay, we have the two representatives who um, uh, are representing Conejos and Costilla County, and um, they cannot do it because uh, there are, uh, um, the laws are written in English, the um, rules of the House are written in English, they ask for a translation of the rules of the House. Now, the rules of the House actually explain how you present a bill and how you, um, the type of respect that you give another legislator, blah, blah, blah. But anyway, they didn't even have these rules that were translated for them. So they were already at a dis, um, disproportionate level of, uh, to act adequately represent the people. Um, the laws, as I said, were only printed in English. They had requested that the laws be printed in Spanish, but the legislature came back and said, well, we don't have any money in our treasure to do that. Then they went to the federal government and asked for the same, uh, uh, the same right, please translate these um, laws into Spanish. And uh, then at that time, the uh, US treasurer had forgotten that these people were part of the, um, those that had, uh, uh, were by right of the Treaty of Guadalupe on U.S. property and then U.S. citizens. Now, that treaty also um, stated that th these Mexican citizens that were now U.S. citizens would be white by race. And that was also a, a big issue uh, during the um, adjudication of the well, I'll call it the adjudication of the treaty. So, but, but I wanted to give you a little bit of history on that. Um, so anyway, so did the Espinosas really have the equipment and the, uh, the uh, arms and ammunition to do the damage that they did? We don't know. I don't have, you know, I don't have an answer. It's just a no, smoke, no smoking gun here. Um, but if we take a look at all that was happening in the period, um, we do know that when, we do know historically that the people of Southern Colorado uh, did not have enough am arms and ammunition and that they were still using bows and arrows. So then we go back to well, what's written about the Espinosas in the newspapers of the time and also um, in the uh, books uh, that I mentioned, the Tom Tobin uh, and the Bloody Espinosas and the other books. Now, um, when Major Holt arrived at the house and tried to uh, uh, arrest the Espinosas, he was not there. He didn't tell them that he was there to arrest them, but he was there to see if he, they wanted to get uh, um, inducted into the service. And um, then when all else goes on, um, uh, I guess uh, Major Meyer grabs Vivian's arm, Vivian, Vivian pulls back into the house and uh, he and his brother then start to gather whatever they have for arms. Now, um, the newspaper says that they both ran out of the house, uh, let's see, discharging bows and arrows while carrying rifles and pistols and running out of the house. And so I kept asking myself, well, how do you carry arms and ammunition like that uh, while you're discharging a bow from your arrow, I mean, a, an arrow from your bow. And so it, it, it can't be done, but there are historical accounts that do say that the Espanos were still using 
bows and arrows to protect uh, their families and for hunting. Um, let's see, I wanted to also show you another. Okay. All right, so then we have the beheading of the Espinosas by Tom Tobin. So if we go back to the map, as I mentioned, Tom Tobin catches up with Felipe and the nephew near Levita or at Levita Pass, and he um, sneaks up on him while going through a lot of brush, and he shoots them, uh, runs up to them, and then later they are decapitated. And now to the Espanos, that's a real, um, well, it, it, it's a violent way to die anyway, you know. Uh, and then to get your head decapitated is, well, the family couldn't even do a, uh, a burial service because the Catholic priest at the time would not do anything with an incomplete body. And um, so this left the family uh, disheartened. And then, of course, you know, they're, the, they're being blamed. But the interesting thing that I want to mention is, all right, so the Espinosas are blamed and um, everybody's looking for them. But there are no accounts in any of the books or uh, historical writings that say that the um, amount of soldiers that were at Fort Garland at the time, um, that, that they were looking for, um, that they were in and about Conejos, but there are no accounts that they were watching the Espinosa family. So um, now I forgot to mention that Major Holt had, uh, I, Oh, I'm sorry, I had said Major Meyer, and it was actually Major Holt. So Major Holt, when he tried to arrest the Espinosas and, and it didn't work out, he set the house on fire. And uh, before that, he had confiscated a trunk, um, some bedding, um, uh, um, some housewares, and some other things. And then the house was put on fire. So there's the concern that now the family does not have a place to live and they have no food and they have no clothing. But we don't know who, who uh, cared for them. And that's an important fact because then we could take a look at by the censuses uh, trying to determine, all right, who might have helped them in getting in getting more am arms and ammunition. And I don't know whether you can see this or not. But anyway, that's one of the other uh, censuses that Major Archibald Gillespie had provided. Um, and then um, now that the heads are brought into Fort Garland, they're uh, placed in a jar filled with alcohol, and they're displayed throughout the territory. And I think that kind of summarizes um, what I wanted to say about the, the, the killings, and we'll go on from there. Great, Virginia, if you wanna return the screen back to the gallery view of all the participants, we have um, some questions that have come in. Uh, a few have been answered. Um, just through the chat uh, version. So this is really exciting um, that the presenters can also fill in some details, um, but things can also be answered live as well. Um, I think I'll just um, start with um, uh, so many great questions here, but um, I think one that kind of jumps us off um, probably the best um, Lisa Hall has asked, is the newspaper article by Meyer the first public accusation of the Espinosas? Who, was, who attributed these murders to the brothers? A correspondent by the name of, uh, the pen name was Dornick. Um, I'm trying to remember his name. And Wilbur later, Stone. Oh, thank you, Wilbur Stone. Stone. Now he later uh, was involved in um, well, he later was a, a territorial justice of Colorado who was also involved in the Conejos land grant uh, uh, court, uh, private court hearings. So that's an interesting fact there. But uh, he was the actual, he was actually the first newspaper correspondent that was sending all of this information about who's, uh, who's being murdered and, and who's uh, accused. 
Does that answer that? Yeah. And he, he wasn't just he wasn't just a newspaper correspondent. He was also a miner. Yes. And, and he was familiar with the California Gulch Boys. Yes, mm -hmm. exactly. And certainly that had, that kind of biased his opinion toward the reporting. Right. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so other questions that have come in, um, who were the Hispanic legislature, legislators, excuse me? Okay. Um, Jesus Maria Barella and uh, Jose Victor Garcia. And my book does include a um, biography of some of those territorial legislators. One has asked, how long were the Espinosa family in the area before this time? Was it from the Spanish period? Okay, uh, we find in 18... Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, we find that in 1861, Felipe actually voted in the territorial um, election. So they were there at least in 1861. Um, and the, by the 1860 census, though, they are in northern New Mexico, near the uh, El, El Rito area. In 1845, the Mexican government census um, has the Espinosa family living in uh, El Rito, uh, the lower Chama Valley, mm -hmm. five miles uh, west mm -hmm. of us. And uh, from that period of time into 1860, 1861, we do have a large migration of Nuevo Mexicanos moving northern in, north into the uh, northern district, what was called the northern district at that time, um, uh, you know, due to population and uh, 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 the quality of the land, so they're moving. They're moving north. Also, the area of Colorado um, was known as nice grazing area. That's San Luis area. So they were already well aware of the area and had been grazing there for for long periods of time, for generations actually. Another question. Sorry, go ahead, James. Oh, I was just going to say. Uh, uh, Tom to in Tom Tobin's book, he states also that uh, the Espinosas made that transition uh, to San Rafael in 1858, um, where it, it, it's not sourced, so I don't know where that information came right. from. Right. And, and when you read those books, you do need to look for some footnotes, um, people, because you know, there's a lot of conjecture um, and speculation, and then you, you think, oh, oh, well, they did this, and then um, you look for the note, and it's not there. So it's just hearsay, conjecture, rumor, whatever that this documented. There's a question that also came in about um, Fort Sumter occurring in April 1861. Um, was it recruitment or conscription from the Union that brought the troops from Fort Garland into the Espinosa property? If conscription draft was allowed, it appears the territories had to provide some of the Union manpower? Right, well, Governor uh, Gilpin was trying to get the, um, uh, the first Colorado volunteers together. Okay, and then you had the New Mexico Military District who was trying to get people to enroll into uh, uh, the U.S. Army. <laughs> so you have, again, some conflicting and, uh, uh, forces there between the two, um, I'll, I'll talk, military areas. Um, you ask about Fort Sumter. Um, I'm spacing out here. Is, is Fort Sumter the uh, Bosque? Uh, where the Navajo were uh, were sent to? Uh, this is a question from one of our attendees. Okay, all right. Well, so. during this time, you have to remember that the Navajo were uh, um, creating some problems for the Nuevo Mexicanos, and so we've got a lot of uh, militia groups and New Mexico volunteers who are out looking for the Navajo. This is where you have Kit Carson and that history coming in. So. Um, I tell you, that period of time was a mess. There were, there were you know, you've got military groups all over and um, searching for all kinds of people, the Espinosas, the, the Navajo, and um, it's, it's kind of a sad period of time. I hope I answered that question. If not, let me know. Um, looks like Fort Sumner, of course, was occurring during Civil War and just the 
the incursion, um, you know, needing to draw manpower and a draft for the militia just kind of sounds from, it was all kind of a perfect storm of all of these kind of volatile needs and wants converging onto the San Luis Valley. Right. Um, except the same uh, then, for the Espinosas. Yeah. Right. I should also mention that uh, Major Gillespie had noted that uh, at San Rafael, that district was very poor, that the most of the women were in rags. And uh, he, in the census, he does talk about the poverty there. So, you know, when the soldiers arrived for this census, uh, uh, I, they were afraid that they were going to take their food. So. Right, and you had a lot of um, other struggling populations. But wonderful comments coming in in the chat box about just people and their their relationships with family and ancestors mm -hmm. at this um, time period. Mm -hmm. uh, some questions coming in to um, to both the, the Q&A and the chat. If we can funnel them over to Q&A, that's easier for me to um, kind of attend to these. Um, and they're just rolling in right now, so that's really great. Um, so uh, I'm trying to keep these things as kind of historical buildup as possible. So I'll be bouncing around with some of your questions. Uh, I'm going to pose this one. Um, was the exclusion of Spanish translated proceedings and the regulations intentional by the legislature? Did they ever address this issue either during or after? So again, kind of getting at the, That's the a very, very good ecology point. of disenfranchisement. Yeah, no, very, very good point. We have to take a look at Governor Gilpin and his executive staff, okay? Now, Governor Gilpin, William Gilpin, is familiar with the San Luis Valley. He was in the Mexican-American War, and um, uh, he had written about coming back to the San Luis Valley, and, and later during, uh, well, I don't want to jump ahead because that's kind of a key Key part I want to tell you, but uh, when he is setting up the territory, you know, he, all of the executive officials for Colorado Territory are determined and by the president. So the president appoints them. These are all presidential appointees that come. Most of them came from the east, and the east, eastern people really didn't know a lot about um, the southwest. Okay, so Gilpin. And his executive body is setting up the territory. Um, the, the territorial judges that are appointed by the president come in. And um, there are some problems because some don't want to serve in the mining districts. And some of the miners don't want that, that uh, territorial judge. They want another one. So, OK, now, the, uh, Governor Gilpin decides to use the laws or uh, the territory the territorial legislature also tries to use the laws from uh, different states. I think it was Illinois and part of Kansas. And of course, the Hispanos know nothing of those types of laws. Now, Governor Gilpin was in a position that he knew the Southwest. He could have taken some of the laws or some of the information from New Mexico and from California at that time. Those were already translated documents, but he decided not to do that. Um, when the legislators come to the um, assembly, then they're asking that the House rules be uh, translated into uh, Spanish. And again, the House rules are general rules that he could have asked California and New Mexico for a simple copy, but that didn't happen. Um, uh, now, now, the territorial treasure, there's a problem because the territory has no money. It has no money. It's got to uh, enact some taxes so that it could get some money. But uh, the governor decides that he's going to go ahead and do the Colorado volunteers and get you know them up and running uh, without any territorial money and without any federal um, uh, approval. Um, so I think the executive officials were really at at a point where you know they could have changed all of this from the beginning. Um, you know, the laws could have been easily translated. They could have requested, um, uh, they knew that these people were coming, but, um, you know, we don't, we, they're saying, no, we don't have the money for this. Then on the federal level, excuse me, then on the federal level, you have a, the U.S. treasurer who says that he can't send any money to uh, Colorado for 
these translations because these people are not U.S. citizens. He's forgotten about the uh, Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo and um, has made some false steps there. Now, the, the delegate from Colorado who was in Washington at the time could have said, no, 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 you know, you're wrong, uh, treasurer, uh, U.S. treasurer, these are citizens and we need your help with this funding. But that didn't happen either. So I think, um, I think I've explained that the executive branches were at fault here. Right, right. And um, so I think we'll just kind of start jumping around between the historical context and then also kind of framing it around um, the role that curators and curatorial assistants have um, played in kind of ascertaining um, this, this, this saga through the artifacts and whatnot. And Matt, um, I was hoping that you could speak to, and it looks like some other folks would like to hear about what it, um, what drew you to this collection in the first place and what kind of your journey has been about um, uncovering all these issues that James and Virginia have spoken to. Absolutely. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Matt Lopez. Um, as James explained, uh, I started with the rehousing project for the museum, and I transferred over into the Espinoza research. Um, where it led me was uh, directly to the donor cards that we have on file at the museum. And with the donor cards, uh, I was able to... Um, figure out who, where these artifacts came from, where these objects came from. Uh, with Leopold Meyer, um, I became really intrigued with that gentleman uh, because uh, before this, I'd never heard of Leopold Meyer. He was just kind of uh, uh, way out there, reference a person who um, did a lot of important things that nobody really uh, knew about. Um, so when we talk about the, the objects of Leopold Meyer and we were questioning the authenticity of these artifacts, what I really had to do is go in and look at the, the details of the trunk, uh, the Pataka trunk that, that is the kind of the focus of, of the Leopold Meyer collection that are, is attributed to the Espinosas. Um, we figured out that it was made in uh, probably Chihuahua, Mexico um, it was a trade trunk um, that was made there. Um, the hardware, interestingly enough, was probably put on somewhere in either uh, northern New Mexico or Taos. And that's where we kind of get into um, the, either the authenticity or the origins of these objects. Um, we have to figure out where they came from, uh, how much would they have been worth uh, or cost at the time, would they have been accessible to these uh, to the Espinozas. Um, there are two or three mentions of the trunk, of a trunk, uh, in the, in the es different versions of the Espinoza story. Um, we've taken snippets from different parts of historical records where a trunk is mentioned. And so Leopold Meyer was, um, he was actually in the room with uh, Tom Tobin and Colonel Tappan at Fort Garland. And why was he there? Why was Leopold Meyer this, uh, this immigrant from, Jewish immigrant from uh, Alsace-Lorraine in, in the room when these guys' heads were taken off? Well, we found out through uh, research that he was a beef contractor at Fort Garland uh, during that time. So that puts him uh, in the time, definitely the time and place. And so he would have had access to that um, to all these people, and he was a contemporary of uh, Otto Mears. He was a business partner of Otto Mears in a business, uh, uh, in a business in the bank with Otto Mears, but um, he, they were definitely his associates as well as Tom Tobin. And Tom Tobin actually uh, states that Leopold Meyer was, was in the room. So um, I think James and I have kind of come to I don't know about it, it's a conclusion, but we've come to uh, an agreement that the trunk probably has a lot of uh, better provenance than most of the other articles that came in with the Leopold Meyer collection um, to include the pistol that uh, before this started, James just informed me that he uh, was able to find that serial number or he was able to find the date of manufacture and uh, was in fact manufactured in 1966. So the pistol in my presentation, the 1861 Colt Navy, uh, was actually not 
we can say for sure uh, part of their crime spree or their supposed crime spree um, just because the numbers don't match up, the dates don't match up. So um, I spent a lot of time in the Hart Library. I spent a lot of time on Google and um, just a little bit of everywhere to kind of find this information. We have some other objects in the museum, uh, a beaver pot, I think that James, gonna, that James spoke about. Uh, we have two more pistols and those items came from uh, William Todd, who we found was a former, uh, I think James, was he a uh, curator of the museum or he was on the, the board of directors, correct? Uh, yeah, I'll talk about uh, about William Todd in a little bit of okay. detail in a few minutes. So, so we, we got all these, uh, we, William Todd, John McCannon, um, and Tom Tobin, who uh, obviously he's kind of a famous figure in, in Colorado, Northern New Mexico. So we were able to kind of piece the story together as far as uh, the Leopold Meyer collection. And so that kind of brought me here. And I just want to let um, attendees know that we are going to extend this program till 2.30, uh, just to accommodate all the questions that are coming in. Um, James, it looks like you would like to answer uh, about um, questioning the attribution of these items and that kind of piggybacks nicely with what Matt was talking about. Yeah, um, yeah, that's, uh, that's the whole point of what, you know, what I, what Matt and I are doing is, is trying to figure out, you know, what the possibilities are that, that they're for real or, or for not, or they're not for real associated with, uh, with the Espinosas. Let me just give you a quick recap of what we've got in the collection that, that, uh, that's attributed to them. Uh, between 1897 and 1964, we got, we've gotten five donations of materials that uh, have, have uh, some attribution to Espinosas. Uh, the first was uh, the Colt, uh, the Colt model uh, 1860 Army revolver. And uh, that was donated by William Todd, uh, who that was talking about. Uh, and that came, that is, uh, that is, that is this particular gun. It uh, was donated at the same time with, uh, with the holster that it came in. And um, the second donation that we received was also from William Todd, and it was the second revolver that we have, which is the uh, uh, the Remington new new model uh, 1861 Navy revolver, and um, and so the question with that with those two or with those three artifacts from William Todd was was uh, who was William Todd, and how how could he have gotten uh, the weapons? Was he was he a miner in the area, or, or just what was he? So Todd um, turns out uh, he was um, he he was actually the the legislator uh, who um, who who passed legislation who passed legislation uh, that created our museum in 1879. Um, he um, was also uh, a Mason, uh, and there's some, uh, some connection with a lot of these artifacts uh, uh, with Masons because, uh, because of the network throughout, uh, throughout the, the uh, state of Masons and, and uh, we believe, well, we were able to find information about um, about where Todd might have, well, where he received one of the artifacts. Um, he received uh, uh, one of the revolvers from uh, a gentleman by the name of Charles Mullen and it was written up in the Rocky Mountain News and I think it was 1902 uh, that uh, that uh, Todd had received this gun from this Charles Mullins guy. So who was Charles Mullen? Uh, he, he is not listed among any of the uh, uh, posse members for, from uh, the McCannon 
posse uh, that tracked down and killed Felipe. So um, uh, I, did, I did some more research on Mullen and the only thing I found was one newspaper article uh, that, uh, that Charles Mullen had discovered uh, a big silver load uh, in, um, I think it was, I think it's Buckskin Joe is where he, where he, um, where he found, found this, uh, silver. And, uh, that was in 1867, I believe, uh, 1860, yeah, somewhere right around there. So it puts him, uh, so it puts him in the area at least, uh, four years after all of, uh, after Felipe was killed anyway. So it's not a direct, we don't know. And, and I w was not able to, that was a dead end. I was not able to go farther to find out, you know, uh, how Charles Mullen got, got the weapon. But, um, but because he's in that vicinity uh, about the same time period that you would expect that uh, artifacts could still be in the area, uh, I believe that um, that that's that that's authentic, and and because Todd, um, uh, Todd and and other people were already collecting history in in Colorado prior to 1879, uh, they had already uh, collected artifacts uh, that uh, were stored in um, in a hotel hotel room on the 17th of Glenarm, I believe was uh, the location <clears throat> because they, they wanted to preserve history here in Colorado. They were seeing artifacts uh, uh, taken out of the state, even out of the country, like uh, the artifacts, some of the artifacts from Mesa Verde. So, so they had, he had in particular a, um, an interest in preserving Colorado history. And so I believe that, that at least he believed that would the, the revolvers that he uh, collected um, belonged to the Espinosas. Again, there's no, there's, there's no, no link directly to uh, somebody taking, taking these weapons off of the Espinosa brothers. A another possibility is that uh, you know some of the some of the people some of the men that were that were killed by um uh that whose killings are attributed to the espinoza brothers uh, uh they all they also had weapons some of which are are documented uh and and one of those is a is a a, a cult navy so so again in the transfer of information, it's possible that uh, one of these guns could be associated with the Espinosas, but not used by the Espinosas. For, for example, that gun could have actually been uh, a gun that was used um, by, uh, his name was Sol uh, Le Lega, I believe. He was, uh, he was one of the gentlemen that was killed uh, on Red Hill Pass. Um, so anyway, uh, again, we can't say for sure, and uh, the time, the uh, the time period is right on the edge on all, all of these weapons. Um, uh, so you also have to ask yourself where, where else could they have obtained them if they if they were purchased? Uh, the Colt Model 1860 at that time uh, sold for uh, fourteen dollars. There were there were areas, uh, there, there was uh, J.P. Lauer, uh, a gun shop here in Denver. Uh, the, there were probably uh, places in Las Vegas, New Mexico, Santa Fe, even Albuquerque were. No, Hot Stuff had a, a store in um, San Luis, but he was on the lookout writing letters to uh, Fort Garland, so he would not have sold at this time any guns to the Espinosas. Or yeah. if he did, he would have let the army know about it. And there's no way to know if if the guns uh, that the Espinosa brothers used were purchased by them or taken or stolen or taken. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, 
And that goes back a little bit to that uh, 1862 uh, military census. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, on the census, it doesn't look like there are many weapons in the area at that time, and, and only one carbine is recorded for uh, the Espinosas. But again, these guys didn't want to get conscripted into the into the military, and uh, uh, it's not like the houses were being searched. In fact, the men weren't even in the area. Most of them ran away, and uh, and the women were giving a lot of information. So, I don't trust I don't trust the information that's in those surveys because um, because I don't think that they would be honest about saying what they had. Mm -hmm because for fear of losing what they had. And the other thing is that there were, as you said, there were militias uh, that, um, that were defending against Navajo raids and, and things, and, and they obviously had weapons as well. So I think that there were weapons. Many were muskets. Yeah, well, again, you have to, um, uh, you have to trust what you're reading on those uh, censuses. Mm -hmm. uh, if that's so. Mm -hmm. so uh, anyway, I, I, I digressed a little bit. Um, the, uh, those were our first two, those were our first two uh, donations. Um, the third donation that we received uh, was in 1943, and that was, uh, the, that was uh, the donation from uh, Adolf Meyer uh, in his father's name, Leopold Meyer. And that was what um, what Matt was talking about. Um, the controversial thing about that donation is the trunk came in with a revolver, with some spurs, um, some chaps, and um, um, the only thing that that's in the paperwork. Uh, attributes the the trunk to the Espinosas. The other things, the other things, are things that you looking at. You would think could those also have been Espinosa brothers? The Spurs, for example, um, are very very similar to a pair of Spurs that are in the Colorado Springs uh, Pioneer Museum that. Uh, their records say that were taken off of um, uh, Felipe Espinosa when he was killed, and uh, and they were um, no they uh, they were uh, taken off of Vivian, and um, <clears throat> and the person who took those was Joseph Lamb, who was the, who was the first person to shoot Vivian, and uh, and he gave those to a judge Castillo. Uh, in Colorado Springs, and eventually that ended up in their museum. And in style, they're very, they're very, very similar to the ones that we have that came with with um, that came with Meyer with the Meyer donation. But we've never we've never um, exhibited them or, um, or or made a claim uh, that they that they are. Uh, Espinosa's, um, uh, we just, it's just one of those uh, artifacts that came with this collection that we, that we question uh, the possibility. Uh, the, the revolver is the one that we uh, dated to 1866, so that definitely is not uh, Leopold Meyer, or I'm sorry, uh, Espinosa. Uh, and the trunk, um, uh, I'm going to let um, Virginia, Virginia, why don't you uh, say a little bit about your doubts about the trunk, why you think that it's not authentic. Okay, I'm finishing typing an answer here, uh, sorry. Okay. Okay. Um, the trunk has a latch on it, and the only time that you would have a latch on a trunk is if you're carrying money. And the Espinosas didn't have any, so unless they had stolen the truck from some more, uh, you know, someone's wagon or something, um, there's a, a, 
an unsourced sentence that says that they may have uh, stolen the trunk from a priest um, whose cargo was being transported out of or to Galisteo near Santa Fe. But they were, if they were on horseback, how did they get that trunk into uh, their house or, or in Conejos? Um, the other thing about the trunk is that it's quite ornate and I think that it might be an older trunk. Can you show a picture of that? Do you have uh, a picture of the trunk? I don't know that I have a, a good picture of the trunk. Um, okay. Um, James, you can show the one right behind you. What's that? Uh, you can show the trunk behind you. Well, yeah, I'll try. It's hard for me to do from here, but. Okay. And these were typical types of trunks that were used by uh, military leaders. So, um, and we have to consider too, that if we take a look even by Googling uh, 1860, 1850 trunks, some of them are just a, a basic wooden trunk. They're, they're just basic. This one is quite ornate that you have the one that you have is quite ornate, and again, because of the locked, uh, uh, the locked pieces that it has. In addition, um, there was very little metal that was in. There was very little metal that was in northern New Mexico at the time, um, and so uh, this is after the Spanish period. There was very little metal, so they were melting down metal to even just make locks for doors or locks for acequias. Uh, irrigation ditch ditches. Well, and I, I counted that with um, with the fact that uh, it doesn't that it that it was probably made substantially earlier than than uh, the time period, mm -hmm. uh, and that it really doesn't matter uh, that you know what trunks were being made in eighteen eighteen That's right. That's or eighteen sixty. Right. But if you needed I, if you, if you needed to build something, you could. Yeah, that was that was my point. I was trying it, to. It, it's a you know it would have been available um, prior to to um, eighteen sixty three, and as far as the and and it would uh, as Matt said, he believes it was made uh, somewhere in Mexico, and it would have been uh, uh, the metal, you know whether metal was um, available in northern. New Mexico at that time really wouldn't have mattered because this would have been a trade, probably a trade good. And, and my belief um, is, is that it, it very well could have been uh, on the Teamster wagon on the way to uh, Glorieta to the, uh, to the priest from, um, uh, from Santa Fe. Uh, and I can't you know, I can't explain how it would have uh, gotten from uh, from Galisteo uh, up to San Rafael, uh, but but um, you know, the just because they were seen uh, and recognized by that teamster, and they were seen riding off to the north. Um, who knows if if there was a wagon or or what else might have been available to them uh, to make that, that trip. But, you know, it's all pure, specul pure speculation. Um, we have no idea, uh, but we do know that a trunk was taken out of, um, out of their home and that, uh, there, uh, that um, a trunk among other personal artifacts of theirs were uh, um, auctioned at Fort Garland, um, and um, uh, that, that uh, Leopold Meyer is in the, is a regular at Fort Garland and would have had the possibility to have obtained uh, a trunk from the house. Um, so, so uh, other things that were were donated with that trunk that we that we also besides the spurs. Uh, there were also some some Arapaho moccasins and uh, some some other uh, braided leather things that um, have uh, that we currently can't um, account for. Um, it, we assume that they're probably still in the collection, but because 
of uh, renumbering and um, uh, just all of the transitions that have happened over 140 some years uh, that, uh, that they've been renumbered and we can't account for them right now. So uh, our fourth donation um, was uh, a kettle. That's how it was identified. Um, and it's, whether it's a kettle or, or whether it's a, a water bucket, uh, it was uh, donated and supposedly, well, it was donated by the daughter of a gentleman by the name of Le Levi Booth. And uh, Levi Booth, uh, people will probably know, if you know Denver history anyway, uh, uh, from Four Mile House, which was a stage stop uh, outside of Denver. But before he, um, but before he moved to Denver, uh, he he lived in Leadville, and he was uh, a resident of California Gulch. So, uh, uh, and that was let's see, that was I don't have the dates, uh, but but it was before he moved to Denver. So he was in California Gulch at the time uh, that all of this was going on. Again, he's not a member of uh, the posse, at least not a recorded member of the posse. Um, somebody told me that he was, but I was not able to locate that information. Incidentally, a lot of the members of the posse were part, uh, were involved in the Sand Creek Massacre yeah. as part of uh, the first Colorado volunteers. Yes, uh, so, so the, um, this is uh, the, the copper kettle. It's in pretty poor, pretty poor shape, as you can see. It was was supposedly taken uh, from the campsite where uh, Felipe uh, and Vivian had been uh, ambushed and killed uh, by uh, by the John McCannon group, and uh, it was taken from the campsite. Supposedly, it contained a beaver tail that was being cooked. Um, at the time of the ambush. Um, obviously, uh, well, it didn't get donated to us until 1957. It might have been in the museum as a loan in 1954. But uh, so that's uh, seven, probably about 70 years uh, from the time it was taken. So, uh, you know, it wouldn't have been in this condition if it was used um, to cook beaver tail, but uh, there's no way for us to know how it was used uh, in the 70 some years before it was donated to us. Uh, the fifth and last donation came to us uh, from uh, the, grand, the grandson of uh, John McCannon, Captain John McCannon, who led the posse that uh, tracked down Felipe Espinosa. And uh, that's, uh, that was uh, a religious medallion that was uh, that was attached to a leather thong, a red be with a red beaded leather thong, and this is all that we have left of that. Those are the beads on the leather thong that was supposedly to this um, to this medallion. We received that uh, donation in 1964, and um, it was put on display, and the medallion uh, was stolen less than less than a year later. Um, of course, uh, security back then wasn't anything like what it is now. And uh, uh, unfortunately, um, many uh, important collections, uh, unfortunately, have been, have been stolen over the years. Uh, Virginia, do you, do you want to speak a little bit about uh, what the medallion actually was? Yes, I, I'll introduce that. Let's see. We don't have any photos of the medallion. Whoops, sorry. But this is a sample. Uh, I think I, I chose a sample from the 1800s, uh, early 1800s. Now, obviously, this one was from Mexico, and it does say Virgen de Guadalupe, ruega por nosotros, okay? Uh, Virgin of Guadalupe, pray for us. So this might have been a type of metal that uh, Vivian, no, uh, that 
Vivian War, yes. And um, again, we don't know how it was acquired, um, but we do know that the uh, church that was built in Conejos was dedicated to the Virgin of Guadalupe. So this medal had some significance uh, to the um, um, to the creation of that church, as well as in, uh, in I believe eighteen what was it seventeen ninety eight when the Virgin actually appeared in Mexico um, to a um, uh, um, a poor farmer. And um, then a church in Mexico City was built and dedicated to her. Uh, I just want to to say that you said that we don't know where uh, where it was obtained from, but we do we do know that John McCannon uh, was was present when uh, Vivian was killed, and uh, I have been able to trace and confirm that. Um, uh, Bruce McCannon and his wife uh, are direct descendants of John McCannon. So, uh, so the claims that they made that uh, that this was taken from Vivian by John McCannon, uh, I think uh, I, I I trust that. And we just have about uh, two minutes left. We've extended the time to two thirty, and I thought um, there's a few lingering questions. The presenters have been doing a great job of answering people's questions um, live as well. So do take a look in the Q and A box where the tab with answered questions to see if uh, your question did get answered. And if it hasn't yet, we'll definitely leave some time for that. Um, but uh, with a just little bit of remaining time left, um, I just kind of wanted to ask a question. Um, it seems like the Espinosa the saga, the story is highly sensationalized. Um, different accounts can have kind of more salacious details than others. And I wonder if this whole um, journey toward the truth is what leads us to really kind of take these complex considerations of the artifacts. And, and so I feel like that's what um, you folks have really done here today is to show that what the truth is of this story has so much impacted the artifacts that have been donated to History Colorado and then how subsequent generations have read these artifacts. Um, and I just, just wanted to kind of see if that's kind of the right temperature to take on this story that perhaps with these artifacts and their donations, people were trying to provide additional proof, additional uh, additional truths to understanding this, but questioning their sourcing um, also should lead people to question whether these sensationalized tales of the Espinosa should stand true today. So just didn't know if you wanted to comment on that connection or if there's something more we wanted to leave our attendees today with to kind of understand the, the overarching view. I'd, I'd like to say that, <clears throat> that it's, um, that it's actually, you know, it's more than just the Espinosas. Uh, you know, uh, the uh, the museum profession uh, uh, in 1879 uh, here in the, the States was, uh, you know, they were inventing things as they went. And we often, uh, not only us, but, but everybody uh, took donations um, and you pretty much had to accept things word and uh, the documentation back then wasn't nearly as thorough as we would take today. Um, I hope that uh, we would have uh, queried our donors in more detail about, um, about specifically how, uh, how that gun got from uh, the Espinosa's hand into the hand of the person who gave it to the person who gave it to the person like <laughs> us. Um, and it just goes, it goes with just about um, all of the artifacts that, that are collected or, or that were collected uh, in those early years. Um, you find once you start digging into, into things that claims are made uh, and you don't know why those claims were made, if they were made you know, um, knowingly mistaken, or or whether uh, whether they just believed what they were 
donating was was accurate. But once you start researching, which is so much easier to do now, uh, you find that this could not be that because of manufacturing date doesn't match up and all this kind of stuff. So, you know, it's really important to uh, uh, to be transparent when uh, when we're exhibiting uh, these artifacts or or however we're using them, and 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 not say that this this stuff is Espinosa's. Uh, we know that. But, uh, but this is what we know about these artifacts. This is the provenance we have. And so um, you, have to, uh, you have to use your, your own judgment. Regardless, regardless of whether, whether these things were actually held by Espinosa's in their own hands, the fact that they were preserved with the story that they have is um, is a way for us to keep that story alive, um, because it's really not about the object so much as uh, the story and, and what was going on at the time. But there's you, much, but, much more to the story. Yeah, yeah. I want to use the last word, but Matt, if you wanted to jump in and add anything, yeah, to that, I have actually Virginia. I have a question for Virginia. Virginia, the Jerry Thompson Civil War History of New Mexico. Um, there was a mention of Jesus M. Sanchez. Right. What have you heard about him, and where does he come into the story, have you heard? Because it looks like um, the federal marshal, A.C. Hunt, he rushed off a story into the Rocky Mountain News, and he explained, uh, dead or alive, uh, of the Espinosa brothers and their associates, Jesus mm -hmm. and Jesus. Mm -hmm. So I, I really haven't okay. heard too much about him. If you can elaborate. Well, um, yes, he did state that this man was there, um, but we can't track him down. I've looked at the censuses, for the 1860, um, well, yeah, the 1860 census, I looked at the 1870, and I also looked at the uh, military census of 1863, trying to track who would have been of age to be with these Espinosas, and I, I couldn't track him down. So I don't know, I don't know, don't have an answer, sorry. Thank you. And Virginia, did you want to have any um, final yeah. thoughts about the, yeah. Well, with everything that was happening in um, Southern Colorado, specifically Conejos at the time, I, uh, you know, how were the Espinosas involved? Were they uh, a part of the insurrection that um, Lieutenant Holt was so upset about. Were they um, in trouble with the military for some reason? Now we have to remember that Fort Garland was a very remote post and that there was a lot of um, alcoholism that took place, a lot of drinking that took place there. Um, could the Espinosas have run into the California Gulch Boys um, by, by uh, attempting to mine there where, where they weren't wanted? Um, we don't know. Lots of questions that are unanswered. Um, but bottom line, I think they were at the wrong place at the wrong time with all of the activities that were happening. I have, oh, yeah, please go ahead. Uh, one thing, the, the two most important artifacts that are missing from all of this are the journal and mm -hmm. Good point. supposedly written to Governor Evans. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. don't find any evidence of the supposed journal that had this uh, poetry and mm -hmm. uh, admission of right. the his crimes that these guys mm -hmm. were involved in. There was a, a letter that was supposedly written to Governor Evans with the plea deals from the Espinosa brothers saying, you know, pardon us or we will continue killing. Mm -hmm. um, there's no evidence of those letters in any of the state archives or any. Right. Right. And we have no accounts that any Hispanos got to see those letters either to help translate or anything. Those yeah, letters were written in Spanish. From my understanding that when they were translated, there were no uh, Hispanic people that spoke uh, Spanish fluently when, those, when they were supposedly found and translated. Mm -hmm. Well, and those, those were given, either. supposedly those letters were given to Lafayette Head. Um, and the, whether Lafayette had sent them, if they, if they did exist, whether he sent them or not, 
What's without, the source on that? that? Lafayette had had them. Pardon me. What is the source that Lafayette uh, had? I'll them? have to get that. Okay. I'll have that for you. Okay, because um, Lafayette Head uh, was the Indian agent, the Conejos yeah. Indian agent, and he kept no um, agency records. And exactly. if he did, if he did, um, and they were in the Conejos um, County Courthouse, that county courthouse burned. Right, but, exactly. But both so, he and so I wouldn't Governor say Evans, that they didn't exist. I'd just say that, you know, it's the, because you have to wonder how a rumor like, like that gets out. Mm -hmm. Five letters were written to to different people, given and given to him. And, you know, mm -hmm. since his records don't exist anymore, it's possible that that they're there. Um, and and there's also, you know, uh, it's been documented um, who supposedly had the, the journal up until mm -hmm. I can't. Remember. Yeah. I just want to mention that when. When Lafayette Head was Indian agent at Abiquiu uh, in New Mexico, he did not keep records there either. The only Indian agent that did at that time was Kit Carson. Yeah. So a lot of questions. So many questions and whether people come away still understanding this story as the first kind of serial killers or understanding the more nuance that the Espinosas might have been scapegoats. Um, this is certainly just the beginning of a conversation that uh, we had originally had intended to have at the History Colorado um, Center and which we certainly hope to do uh, in the fall or later on. So this is just the beginning of a conversation and we really invite you folks um, to come back to us um, when uh, the time is right again to either see the guns at the Zoom In exhibit at History Colorado Center, explore the archives at the Stephen H. Hart Research Center, or visit the El Pueblo, Fort Garland, and Trinidad Community Museums in the heart of Colorado Southern borderland. So let this all be inspiration for when we can go back to these places to um, really explore these questions further. And so I wanted I to know, mention, if, if you're yeah. interested in reading books about the Espinosas and the books that we've mentioned, those will be at the gift shops at um, the History Colorado Museums. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I also and, want to mention, that I want to say thank you to History Colorado for um, having this presentation, having this session, and uh, for us to speak about this important history. You're welcome. And I want to thank all the presenters for um, bearing with us as we had to uh, reschedule this and kind of take on a new platform. I think it's been really effective today and people's questions. I hope we have attended to them. If not, you can always email me afterward and we can um, get you more book suggestions, the PowerPoint shares and so forth. So this is not the, the ending of this engagement. I certainly hope it's the beginning. Um, and just want to let you know that there's some more upcoming events happening um, for the Borderlands Lecture Series this coming Thursday. Uh, you can register on uh, Facebook. It's going to be a talk about Cinco de Mayo and American tradition. If you're interested in signing up for announcements for the next Insights and In-Person, we've got a few things um, that we're also developing that will be both an in-person and a digital component. So thanks to those of you who have made that suggestion and answered that question. So we'll drop the link in the chat box where you can sign up to learn more about upcoming Insights and In-Person programs. Um, this event was free, but if you enjoyed it and you want to keep supporting programs like this and what History Colorado is doing, we'll drop a donation link into the chat box as well. Something as simple as $2, $5 just really goes so far um, uh, in the age of this COVID-19 uh, rearrangement of things. And um, it looks like uh, Bethany has already shared with you a way to access the collections if you're interested in looking into the archives, some of the books that we have there, which will ad in addition be in the gift shop. So thank you once again, everyone, um, for your questions today. Apologies if we haven't gotten to everything, but again, this is just the beginning of the conversation. And um, we, will, uh, we will see you next time. So thank you so much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. So we'll hang on here for just a little bit longer if there's any, some concluding. But okay. thank you. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to review some yeah. of these questions that are coming yeah. through. I think some of you are better to answer those. And I see some participants raise their hands too. Let's see here. My ancestors, I can follow Virginia, there's a good 
Good question uh, from Kathleen Romero. Go ahead and read it to me. I'm sorry. Um, my... Are you suggesting that the Espinosas were innocents who mm -hmm. targeted as scapegoats for a series of murders that were loosely attributed to the same Mexicans, or yeah. that it is, that, or that it's possible that they did a few murders but not all attributed to them? Yeah. Unfortunately, there's no way to tell, but we do know that there were a lot of um, mob vigilantes around and that there were a lot of um, hangings and um, uh, uh, collective justice or collective injustice that was being held. Yeah, yeah, that's for sure. Along with the California Gulch Boys, there was also a second the, uh, posse called the Sawatch Rifle Company. Mm -hmm. They're also involved yeah. in kind of the man -hunt, vigilante manhunt. Mm -hmm. uh, as well. So it seemed like a lot of frontier justice was being doled out at the time. It's yeah, unbelievable. Thanks, and, and also, not that it was just frontier justice, but the um, brutality of it. <laughs> you know, um, the brutality that was uh, attributed to the Espinosas as well as what happened to the Espinosas and uh, the same thing with Sand Creek. Um, unfortunately, we didn't, you know, I didn't get a chance to, uh, didn't have time to talk about some of those um, connections through the Masons to Sand Creek and, uh, you know, collecting mm -hmm. objects as well as these type of objects and, um, and where the heads are, where they've gone. <laughs> Did somebody ask a question about the heads earlier, about the heads being in the basement of the Capitol, I, I believe? They did, yeah. Uh, and that's all, I, I didn't see the answer, but there's also a new, uh, some speculation that's not, it's new to me, that the heads were actually, or one of the heads was in the basement of the Sonic Temple on Federal Boulevard in North Denver. The, right, and that's, that's why, <clears throat> that's, that's why I, if I ever do this presentation or something like this, myself and I have enough time then I certainly will bring in a lot of those Mason's connections and those kind of uh, mm -hmm. activities. Yeah. yeah. Um, Virginia, are you interested in uh, making your PowerPoint available? Yes, that would be fine. Okay. Well, it looks like we got all the questions answered then. Um, okay. Okay, I just wanted to make one last uh, comment about uh, the executives uh, of Colorado Territory that by 18, um, I'm trying to remember the year, let's see, Governor Gilpin was removed from office after a year and uh, he was, he remained in Colorado and later purchased the Sangre de Cristo grant from Charles Bobien. Those changes also brought a lot of um, Change, uh, a lot of change to the Espanos that were living on that land grant. And from there, we see a big migration of people moving to Werfano County in the 1860s, mid 1860s because of that. Um, and then there's the Homestead Act that opened up. So uh, mm -hmm. they found home in uh, Werfano County then. But Governor Gilpin sure made out. He bought the land at a very, very, very low price. Then he started to create these, um, uh, the Trinchera Estates and the uh, uh, Costilla Estates. And these were uh, land companies promoted by the Dutch and uh, I'm, I'm, I believe the uh, Germans. So they were trying to make Conejos and Costilla County um, I guess they were trying to get it populated, really. And uh, you can tell by the laws that were being passed at the time that that must have been what they were trying to do because um, they were comparing Conejos, the town of Conejos, to Denver, which there was no comparison at the time. But you could not have sheep around Denver, and you were not supposed to have, by this law, not supposed to have sheep around Conejos. But again, totally different towns at that time. So it, it didn't make sense because the majority of the uh, uh, livestock that was in that area was sheep. These were sh uh, sheep raisers. 
Virginia, um, you know, uh, how do they say, sometimes um, history doesn't change, you know? Uh, sometimes what was, did you notice the thing behind me here? Oh, yes. Yep. We did not cross the border. The border crossed us. Exactly. Exactly. Can you imagine waking up one morning and you're in a new territory? You know? Yeah. Mm. Now, well, if we had done that to Wyoming or part of Wyoming, you know, imagine how they would react. And yeah. uh, apparently that it, was a thought at one time. What's different here, though, is, is that the culture difference. You know, mm -hmm. it's not just... You know, it's not just that the border changed, but um, but it changed for that culture. You right. know, all of a sudden they were part of a different culture, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they weren't accepted, and uh, they they were just numbers uh, to get to to get to to get a ter to become a territory. And the history that was remembered was the Mexican American War, who yes. won and who didn't. And, and that's, uh, yeah. mm -hmm. 